have been incredibly fortunate in my life to have been mothered well, not just by my own mother, but by various women in my life. And one in, and I've observed them and learned from them in, in so many different ways. And one of the first kind of lessons I learned that I didn't really even kind of connect with until much later um, was observing my sister-in-law, who I consider a dear friend, um, but also I have observed her because her children are now, her youngest just graduated um, college. So um, she is moving into a different stage of life where I am in a very early stage of motherhood. But I remember watching her with my nieces and nephew. And when, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but siblings fight. I know it's shocking. Maybe, maybe you and your sibling always got along or you were fortunate enough to be an only. But um, the reality is they tussle. They hurt each other. They break stuff. And my sister-in-law would say to them, make it right, not say you're sorry. She, never, she didn't say that. Make it right. And I realized what she was doing was trying to teach them reconciliation. Like, go repair what you've broken. If you've hurt them, comfort them. If you've broken their toy, help them fix it. If you've knocked down their tower of blocks, help them rebuild it. Make it right. And I loved that kind of that image of not just words. Like, and words matter. Words matter a lot, but sometimes we waste words. And we think words cover it, right? We're like, I'm sorry. Are you really? Really? You know, like, I watch my kids do this sometimes. Like, sorry. Like, my youngest does this all the time. Like, he steps on you. He bumps into you. And I'm like, ow. And he's like, sorry. Like, sweetheart, we got to work on your tone. You now he's three. And I think for us as Christians, we have to be masters at the art of reconciliation. And the beautiful thing is that Christ always invites us to be amateurs, to practice this again and again, because he is a master reconciler. And we get to learn from him what that looks like. And today we're going to dig into the letter to the Ephesians, which was written by the Apostle Paul. And if you want to follow along in your Bible um, or open a Bible app, I encourage you to turn to the New Testament, go past all those Gospels, get to the... Um, the letter to Ephesians, or maybe in your Bible it says the epistle, just another fancy word for letter. And to know, like, this was Paul's writings to a church community in Ephesus, which was an ancient city in Asia Minor. Asia Minor is really most of what modern Turkey is now. And so Ephesus was this thriving community, um, and there was a Christian community there. And so Paul wrote this letter to them around probably 60, 62 AD while he was in prison, most likely in Rome. So this is a prison letter. And it's coming to him or coming from him to encourage the Ephesians. And a lot of times Paul is going to write to people um, because they need encouragement or they need correction or they need both. And so he's writing to them um, to give them a little bit of instruction and he's trying to get them to realize, like, there's a lot of division going on. I need you to refocus. You're fighting the wrong team. You know, you're fighting within each other. And he wants them to understand the beauty of unity that we have in Christ and that we have a life that we are to live out that is worthy of that calling into the family of God and that in our life, Christ should be supreme and central. Christ should be the most significant thing about us. Not the only thing, but the most significant thing about us. And so when Paul writes this letter, he is kind of emphasizing the richness of God's grace because he wants them to get, this isn't about you working towards something. This is about you responding to the graciousness of God. See, we, we don't do these things. We don't follow God's will. We don't seek God in things to earn his love. We already have it at full capacity. We can't get God to love us more. It is how we live should be a response to that love and grace. 
And this is really what Paul is encouraging them to do because he's seeing they ain't doing it. They're treating each other like, pardon my French, crap. And so this is the importance of what it is to live out our faith, not to earn God's love, but because it's a response to God's love. And see, we live in this world that loves division. We love to divide ourselves. We love to pick sides. And I believe that Ephesians presents us with this powerful image of what it is to be unified in the body of Christ, to be builders of bridges constantly that unite rather than divide. Now, like I said, when Paul is writing to a faith community, it's usually when there's a problem. It's kind of like those policies at work. You know, policies at work really only happen because people mess up. One person messed up, so now there's a policy about it. Okay? You know, someone left food out in the break room, got ants, no more food in the break room. One person makes a mistake, so to prevent any future mistakes, we now have a policy on the books. Um, now, at least in this situation with Paul, he isn't writing a policy for Christians, but he is writing to correct. He's reminding them of what is important. And I think this, is, this would get us a little bit further in life if we embrace this rather than policies, is we got to what we really value, what was important. We want a clean working space. How do we do that? Now, Paul gets at it, though, by helping us to understand what the problem is. And so the problem in Ephesus right now is that the Christian believers are at odds. So let me read this passage for us. These are our first couple of verses. For he himself is our peace, who made two groups one and has divided, has destroyed the barrier, dividing the wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. See, Paul is saying, I see the division that Christ has abolished. You're trying to recreate. You're trying to rebuild the wall he broke through. You see, there's two different groups in the Ephesian church, and there were a lot of tension between these two groups. There were the Jews who had come to faith in Christ, and then there were Gentiles. And if you remember from last week, we talked a lot about Gentiles, of people who were basically the equivalent of a, a non-Jew. So if you were Jewish to the Jews, you were Gentile. And so Gentiles would be drawn, attracted to this faith of the Jews, and they would become converts. But they were still looked at as Gentiles. And so there's this huge division because the Jews who have embraced Christ are telling the Gentiles, well, you're not quite there yet. You know, we want to make sure that the faith is continually valued. So they saw themselves as gatekeepers. They saw themselves as being, you know, kind of the, those guardians of the faith. And the Gentiles always felt like outsiders in this as well. And so this division leads to hostility because it's not true integration here and conflicts that were just getting out of control. And specifically, this conflict was around the practice of circumcision. The Jews expected the Gentiles to become circumcised, as well as to start to keep kosher, you know, practice the dietary laws. So embrace the Jewish faith, because now you've come to Christ, so you're going to embrace all these cultural norms that we have as well. And the Gentiles' response to this, hell no. You ain't bringing anything near me. No, 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 no. I really don't feel comfortable with sharp objects in that area of my body. I, I, I appreciate their concerns. And so they found this to be a barrier, kind of a turnoff, but for good reason. And, and while we don't have arguments like that for the most part in our world today, we have a lot of division, don't we? We have some racial, some cultural, socioeconomic, I don't know, political maybe, theological. Oh man, it gets big. Um, and these divisions, they create these walls of hostility where we are tugging and sniping and pulling at each other, picking at each other so that we're always on edge. We always feel like we gotta watch our back. We gotta read between the lines between what people say. Because what they said is kind of like, you know, maybe was that a backhanded compliment? Are they really insulting me as opposed to giving me, you know, a compliment? And we start to see people as, as enemies, you know, people out to get us. We see them with bad intent or malice, 
towards us. And, and rather than, you know, assuming good intent or maybe good intent, poor execution, right? that happens a lot. But we just see the execution, right? We see, man, you made a mess. That's awful. Rather than find out what was their intention, because their intention may have been beautiful and kind and thoughtful. They just executed it poorly. Or good intent. Um, my friend Alan likes to talk about this. Do not assume malice when ignorance could be the re reason. You know, good intent can, coupled with a little bit of ignorance, it, it, it can happen. And I don't, I don't enjoy this, to be honest. I don't enjoy being around people I gotta walk on eggshells around, or I have to watch my six because I know people are out to get me to say nasty things about me. And this division is happening in an early church community. And it's hurting the church and others' experiences with that church. Because people notice. People notice how we treat each other. People notice when there's division and tension. And so Paul continues here, um, explaining the foundation of unity for us. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. One body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. The key to building that bridge between groups is the cross. Is that when we look at what Jesus has done to bring us together to make a way for us to be in relationship with God and others. Everything else is details. That the key to building bridges between groups is realizing our identity in Christ. Regardless of our backgrounds or our differences, we are united in him. Through his sacrifice on the cross, Jesus brought reconciliation and peace. Reconciliation with God means that our unity that Christ invites us into isn't simply unity with other believers, but unity in Christ. Because when we're all unified in Christ, that means we're all together. We're all on the same page. And the beautiful thing is our unity is not simply a human effort, but a divine work. God reconciled us to himself through Christ. God did the work. God was the one to do the work to make it right. He rebuilt what we broke. He mended what we tore. He comforted what we broke and other people through his effort. And this reconciliation extends from him to us into relationships with other people, to one another. And when we embrace that truth, we can start to break down the walls of hostility and we begin to build bridges of understanding and love. See, God has made a way for us to be forgiven completely. God made a way for us so that we are forgiven completely, which brings us into full relationship with him. And that full relationship with him empowers us to be in unity with others. Because when we don't feel very loving towards another person, we draw on the love that God has shown us. And remember, this unity is not about uniformity. And that uniformity was kind of what those Jewish Christians were expecting of the Gentiles, right? They wanted them to be uniform, like them. But that doesn't get you to unity. That just gets you carbon copies. That doesn't get you to the rich, beautiful diversity that God has already created in this world. And so let's look at these last few verses here, these last few words Paul has for us today. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For though... For through him, we both have access to the Father through one spirit. Preached peace to you who were far away. Preached peace to the Gentiles. And he preached peace to those who were near. He broke down barriers that had been there for centuries. And the thing is, both groups needed peace. Both needed peace. It wasn't that the ones who were near had it all together. They were still as far from God as those who were far away because they always had to go back to the sacrifice system. So they were always in a challenging relationship with God that Christ solved on the cross. And that peace 
of knowing that we are completely, utterly forgiven is what Christ offers us. And that empowers us to be in unity with one another. And this is Christ's ministry of reconciliation that he invites us into. See, just as Christ preached peace, we are called to be ministers of reconciliation. Preachers of peace, if you will. See, our words and our actions should reflect the message of peace and unity that's found in the gospel. And we reach out to those who are far as well as those who are near. Sometimes the ones who are near are the hardest, aren't they? They, they cause us the most challenge. But we are called to reach out towards all. Bridging gaps, no matter how small or large, that divide us. This is, this is work, y'all. This is hard work work. Worthwhile work, but hard work nonetheless. And we, we have hard work ahead of us. We have hard work every day because we got to deal with people. I like people some days. I try to love people every day. And I'm sharing this, yes, because we're entering a process of merger. And I say this, though, not because there's already division. We're not at odds with these churches, but we are human. And sometimes we hear things the way we want to hear them, we sometimes look to take offense when someone doesn't even intend it. We take offense when someone doesn't like what we like. Again, remember, unity, not uniformity. You know, in my house, my children cannot call food yucky. They, can't, they can say, okay, they can't call it yucky, but they can say, I don't like this. And it was beautiful the other night. Hunter said, I tried the cheese, Mom, but I don't like it. Awesome. Because when they say yucky... They're insulting the person who prepared the food, me, and they insult the folks who are actually enjoying the meal. You know, you're sitting there, you're enjoying what you're eating, and someone goes, that's disgusting. Yeah, I, I would hope that most of us are secure in ourselves to go, whatever. But a lot of times I'm like, no, it's not. It's delicious, and you're stupid. And, and see how it goes? Or we say, well, I really enjoy it. And then you go off, and you're like, that person is just... And I know that as an adult... We should be able to move past when people insult us, especially something we like or we value. And it's hard, though. It's hard, especially if I don't know them, right? If I don't know you and you devalue something I greatly value, I start to take offense, usually. I start to look at you with very judgy eyes, and I'll often invite others into my judginess. I'll create a circle of judginess, a team, if you will, and start to you know, encourage them to judge that person as well. We team up, don't we? We take sides. Politics, anyone? You see, I see this, and we're entering into the most beautiful season. Summer. Yes, yes, it's summer. Uh, Nothing not about politics. Um, but the beautiful thing is that sometimes when, in politics, we talk more, less, we talk less about the value of our candidate, and we talk more trash about the other gal. We hate people. And we say it. And hate can sometimes appear to unite people more than that positive connection we could find saying, that's a candidate who I can get behind because they have my values, not because they're against the other dude. You know, there's an emotional intensity to hate. And it's, it gets a little exciting in that way because anger and fear and frustration can create this sense of urgency. It also can form a little group identity. Like, we can say, oh, we both, we three, we don't like that? Awesome. Let's be a team. There's a simplicity in hate as well. You know what you're against, and you, then you suddenly have an us versus them mentality. And it's a powerful motivator for action. That emotional intensity could really motivate us to take action on things. And that when we feel threatened or we may feel outraged, shocked, or willing to protest or fight, and that the sad thing is that hate can temporarily unite us, but it comes with so many negative consequences, so much division, that when we operate from that mindset, that we actually create division that doesn't allow for compromise or working towards a common good. That could have happened if we could start to talk about what do we value together? What are we trying to accomplish? Why do we value this thing over this? What is behind that? If we were more curious than we were critical of people, we might get further. Because those things that are created out of empathy, compassion, love, they last longer in the long run. They build stronger 
often more sustainable connections, but they require a heck of a lot of work and a lot of humility. And the thing is, sometimes our anger at people starts small and somewhat insignificant, but it can get big and overly important pretty quickly. And we need to draw on that peace from God to slow down. We need to say, God, what do I really need to see in this situation? What is the peace that you bring into this situation? We draw on that. We take that pause. We take that deep breath. We remind ourselves that we are all made in the image of God. We are all made in the image of God. So that candidate, that political candidate, you just can't stand on TV. Shocker, made in the image of God. So when you are critiquing, when you are tearing down, you are tearing at the very image of God. What gives you that right? I want us to remember that continually. We are all made in the image of God. We are all beloved of God, regardless of what we believe, too. So I want us to kind of hear Paul's words as he spoke, or as he wrote them to the Jews and the Gentiles, that they had to learn to value their unity in Christ more than their unique attributes. They had to value their unity in Christ more than their unique attributes. That Christ became the most significant thing about them as it should be about us. It's not the only thing, but it's the most significant thing that we draw on the peace of Christ to empower us to, to worship together, to work together, to care for a hurting world together. See, our unity or disunity impacts not only our relationships with one another, but our relationships with others. People take notice, and it impacts our relationship with God. It grieves the heart of God to see us tear at one another. And we need to remember continually, through Christ, we have access to the Father through the Holy Spirit. All have access to God. Now, do all draw on that access? Not necessarily. But we all have it. Thus, no one is better than another. There is no requirements or steps that you need to fulfill to gain access to God. You have it. The person in the grocery store has it. That per the coworker who chews really loudly in their cubicle next to yours, they have it. That neighbor who throws the biggest parties and the loudest events, they also have access to God because they are made in the image of God. We need to keep this in mind as we move into not only the situation of merging, but in our everyday lives. Have you ever had two family members at odds with one another? Oh, yeah, it just stays between the two of them, right? No. They start to, like, look for allies. They pick sides. They, did you believe what Martha did to me? She brought a sponge cake, and I clearly said I was going to bring a sponge cake. Why is it that we always pick on women at potlucks and creating family disputes? But, you know, but when two family members are angry at each other, it affects the whole tribe. We feel like we're supposed to take sides, or we have to tiptoe around them. You know, and I have a really fancy Greek word for this. Garbage. Garbage. The only side is Christ's side. And we ask questions to understand. We share truth and love because, again, the only side is Christ's side. And it doesn't mean that you put this phrase in front of everything. It means you act it out. And the phrase is to share truth and love. So often I hear people say, I just want to share truth and love. And then they completely tear you down. And there's a problem with that because it's easy and it's hurtful because the concept is that you put a phrase in front and then you're, you're immune to any hurt that you've done. No, it's not how it's done. Because if you put that phrase, I just want to speak truth and love to you, and then you fling a whole bunch of garbage at them, all they're going to pay attention to is the smell of the garbage and how much it hurts. You speak truth and love when you love the person. You speak truth and love when you love that person. And love is an action. Love is not simply a feeling. And sometimes we have to act in love towards another, even if we don't feel it. That is what we're called to do. How do we love them well? Again, as we talked about last week, love is to act or will the good of another person. Love is to act towards or will the good of another person. You want good for them. You try to do good for them. So do you want good for them or do you want to be right? So often I just want to be right. Do you want 
good for them or do you want your pound of flesh? Do you want to get back what you feel was taken from you? Every day, every day, we have a chance to be peacemakers. This is an active role, to be makers of peace. Makers of peace in our homes, our families, our schools, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, and our churches. We can bring division or we can stay focused on our unity in Christ and be bridge builders within our own communities and beyond. You know, in our own situation, as a church that is relocating and merging, the goal, the goal is to become a unified church with these two other churches. That three churches will become one. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of change. It's a lot of letting go of some things and embracing others. And at first, we're going to feel like roommates. We're going to have to figure out you know, how to share things, how to work together. We're going to agree on some things, and we're going to disagree on others, and that's okay. Unity does not mean uniformity, but it's how we approach our differences. Do we seek to learn about one another? Do we seek to be curious as opposed to critical? Let's keep our focus on Jesus, not just in this merger, but in our everyday lives, that we can be unified with people without being uniform, to be bridge builders in our communities and beyond. So my friends, may we embrace our identity in Christ to break down barriers of division, promote unity and reconciliation where it's needed, and to remember that it is through Christ, through Christ that we find true peace and true harmony. Amen. Amen.